Good evening once again. I would like to introduce uh, our last panelists and uh, moderator. Yeah, I, I think let's sit all together. And maybe first uh, a short explanation because the uh, personal uh, uh, personal combination here uh, changed slightly. Uh, it differs from what we have in the program. Uh, Visam uh, was not able to attend because of visa issue, so his visa expired and he was not let out from uh, Palestine. So we are missing one uh, one panelist, uh, an ar architect from from Palestine, uh, but. Uh, we have here on the stage uh, Alper Kaskho. <laughs> oh, okay, your surname, so it's proper. Kazok. Kazok. Uh, who is a member of Umschichten Collective? Uh, Umschichten uh, is a collective coming actually from uh, Germany, and uh, we've been collaborating a couple of good years uh, ago uh, during the residency on the. Uh, on the, I would say, uh, like human uh, aspect of our institution, and uh, they are working uh, by doing, I would say, the way of thinking by doing uh, in the architecture. And uh, Alper is here with us because he was invited to take part in the project Everyday Forms uh, of Resistance. Uh, that will end up with an exhibition uh, next year at Ujazdowski. Uh, I would like to introduce also Joanna Rajkowska, Jana Rajkowska, who uh, actually was supposed to be in the first panel, so it's also misleading, but uh, we found a solution, uh, and, and Jana is with us uh, Today, uh, Jana, is no, Jana is known from the uh, great public uh, interventions and uh, uh, also deals recently a lot with the issues that are related with urbanity, biotop, uh, Anthropocene. Uh, Ahmad Al Akra, uh, Ahmad is coming from uh, now from Europe actually, uh, but uh, Palestinian uh, origin architect who took part in the residencies, who will take part in the residency uh, in Helsinki in frame of our uh, project uh, and collaborated uh, years ago with, uh, with uh, Riwak uh, also. So you have this like link to the uh, Caldun's um, let's say yesterday's presentation. And Simona uh, de Jacobis is an uh, architect, but also recently I would say a photographer. Uh, Simona is working uh, together with uh, Małgorzata Kuciewicz in the collective Centrala, dealing with the issues of uh, urbanity and uh, uh, city. I appreciate a lot your narrations uh, and different ways of reading Warsaw, uh, which is like uh, especially fascinating. So I give you um, I give you the stage and. Thanks, Ika, for the wonderful presentation. So I will not add any more words to uh, uh, for describing our guest, and I will just uh, like to Ahmad to start with the first presentation of the panel. Uh, hi, it's the microphone, right? Okay, hi. Khaldun's uh, uh, presentation was actually a very good. Uh, foundation for what I'm about to start now. So Khaldun talks about the situation of urbanity in, uh, in Palestine, but I'm gonna talk about a uh, much more personal narrative toward uh, this urban development and what at least I want to do, or what at least I'm trying to do uh, in my daily production and my daily uh, my daily practices. Uh, in order to start, I want to say two stories first of how I eventually arrived at this point, why I'm here right now. And uh, there are two separate incidents that happened to me during uh, in 2015 and in 2016. 2000, in 2015, I was doing my uh, master degree on Qalandia refugee camp. And uh, I was doing about uh, temporality permanence and temporary architecture. And I was a bit naive at that time, honestly. I was going around the camp, uh, 
following uh, what the University of Edinburgh taught me to do, having some interviews with people and then reporting them back and preparing a master thesis, the most naive master thesis, I would think. But then I met, uh, during my time in the camp, I met uh, a handicapped person called Khaled, and uh, he was taking me around the camp a bit to show me the space. We were talking about perception of different spaces in the camp, and then he said something uh, about uh, that he doesn't see what I see in terms of space. Like we see the same forms, but we perceive them differently because he doesn't have access. So, and in a space as uh, in a geography as the camp, and in the absence of a uh, formal institutional political uh, structure that would actually provide infrastructure for uh, the handicap, he had to take leads on himself. He had to actually uh, perceive the space differently and uh, oh, different of what we uh, of what we usually perceive. So for him, stairs start to be different, windows start to be different, uh, and so on. So for him, he 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 was constructing this new form of. Uh, a new perception of a space that was completely different. He was using it differently yeah, and going around it. And then I realized that actually most of the people in the camp, they deal with the space that way. Space for them is, is, is I don't want to say temporary because I still don't know, but it's temporal, it's highly temporal. Like it has a high quality, temporal quality that is never defined. It's a liquid space, a very liquid space that could accommodate different, different forms of definition. It unfolds itself to the user, whoever wants uh, so this, is, this was the first story that uh, led me to uh, where I am right now, to think about uh, a new form of space that only exists within the camps and compare it to uh, uh, the urban development of the cities surrounding it. The second story was, happened uh, during uh, 2016 when we, we were in a party in uh, Ramallah. Uh, mainly uh, a party, people were having fun and enjoying the time and suddenly uh, all of us we received uh, the news that there is a, a, a dead kid, 16 years old kid, who was shot in the head uh, near Jalazan refugee camp. And uh, during the party, the party was located almost in the center of Ramallah. And um, the people who attended there, they were the, the high, like the high class of, of Ramallah. They, we were talking and uh, having fun and enjoying. And suddenly we were, uh, we were on the balcony and we saw the uh, people from the refugee camp of Jalazon, like the young kids from the refugee camp of Jalazon, they just start to storm Ramallah, destroying whatever was open. They destroyed one bank, I remember, a bank called Safa. They destroyed another uh, uh, restaurant that was open. They destroyed like five or six restaurants. Whoever, anything that was open, they were destroying it. And then a discussion evoked at that time, most of the people, they were against that. Like, what are they doing? Like, why they, the, the, uh, the kid was shot by the Israelis? Why? the refugee camp inhabitant, they're coming and attacking our city. I mean, that's, they, they are just savage. They're savages, those uh, people who uh, come. They, 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 they just don't understand. Like, it's not our problem that the, uh, that the kid got shot. And that's the second story that uh, evoked in me. Like, why actually uh, the inhabitants of the camp, they attack the city? I mean, what's going on? And starting then, I start to realize that uh, there, is, there is a gap that happened between the city and, uh, and, uh, and the camp that was materialized after Oslo in 1993. And I can see that there, there were two forms of, uh, two projects that we have now, actually, in, or three, if we consider what's happening in Gaza. There is two materialized projects, a project that exists in the city, a city as an occupator of that project, especially the city of Ramallah, with its infrastructure and its new kind of uh, urban planning, and, uh, and, uh, and the project within the camp itself. It's a liberation project that has different, and, ha and it has its own special products. So for me, I don't see the camp in terms of temporary and permanent, but I see the camp as a highly temporary place that responds, that's very much respond to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to a current reality that is rooted at some, at somehow in the past, like uh, in all the discourse about uh, migration and space within refugee camps, it's always uh, uh, either about agents, political agency or either about uh, uh, reclaiming uh, uh, their needs or whatever. But I, I see that uh, they, have, they have managed to create a space away from romanticism. They have managed to create a space that actually accommodates three different times. One that's rooted in the past, one that corresponds to the present, the current need, and one that actually aspires to a future. That's not known yet. So the first, uh, 
What I'm trying to do now in my, in my time in Helsinki, I'm working on something called the Living Room Project. The Living Room Project, I, I heard Sandy yesterday talk about, talk, talks about different form of a living room in the camps. So I just changed it and added uh, Living Room 2.0. So just to, for the copyright uh, issues. And, uh, and uh, so my, 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 my project is actually an exploration of space that I can actually borrow from the camp. I wanted to take it out from the, I don't want to add anything to the camp. I think the camp, it exists the same the way it is because it is, it has to be the way it is. It's not my problem, it's not my thing. I cannot intervene, I'm not from there. I don't want to create public spaces inside. I don't want to create any uh, green or vertical. It's not my issue there. The camp exists in that way because it has to exist in that way. Other, other than that, it's a political question that is there. And uh, there had been a lot of uh, attempts toward uh, developing the camp or, or empowering people or whatever, but myself, and because I, I, I can declare it and I say I, am, I hate the concept of state and the notion of state in general, and I'm actively working toward deconstructing a state, and I think that Palestinians have the chance to work toward the boss state, an unfetishized state, a state that doesn't fetishize itself and its culture, but rather has a, a post form of a state, a post form of identity, an identity that is very temporal to the moment. I, I wanted to the camp to, to seek this form of places, and actually went to different places. But I found the most convenient to the Palestinian context is the camp. I went to Athena, to Exarchia, to see, because there, there is an autonomous rule. But there was a lot of problem there that happens. I've been looking around, but I thought that the camp is actually the most uh, convenient uh, place to learn from, because it, it is very close to the Palestinian uh, history and uh, context. And uh, the Living Room project is an exploration of, 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 of the space in the camp. The living room in the camp that I was talking about, uh, I was talking with the, a woman from the uh, Women Association, uh, whatever, whatever, an NGO in uh, Kalandia. And uh, she told me that uh, she knows and she's very aware that uh, the public space in the camp is whatever <laughs> space in the camp, it's patriarchal. And she's very aware of that. And she said, everybody knows that. We don't need the Europeans to come and tell us that the space in the camp uh, is patriarchal. We know that. But, uh, and she started to tell me how they approach that, like they, they are in need of public space. Uh, so I, she started to tell me about the living room, how the living room at some point of the time, at some point of the day, they became highly temporal, like they became public spaces, like female kind of specific public spaces where all female and kids are allowed to go to the living rooms without even knocking at the door. Like they know the ladies of the, this neighborhood that this is a living room that uh, she's inviting us there. So they go there, they sell some stuff, they do some food, they talk politics, they marry people to each other, and they do all the kind of thing only for two, three hours a day, and shit. And they do that in different form of living room around the the, the, the refugee camp. And and actually, it's such living room as well. It's not only a living room for women to meet. It's also a living room for people to hide. It's also a living room for for uh, people to get engaged. A, a living room for people to uh, to 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 sit and meet. So this such space in the camp, such living room, has different more functions. Has it's a liquid. It's unfolds itself according to who you are. And uh, uh, so I'm working that. On, uh, I'm working now on exploration of just. Uh, I'm doing my PhD to, uh, on that subject, and on not the living room. My PhD is about uh, the whole space in the camp. I'm trying to see the different, for, the different kind of people, how they use different space. The people who are uh, uh, hunted by the Israelis, the people who, the, the, the women, the kids, the man, the political, what happens in different times and in different forms. The space is liquid and actually it can be uh, constructed the way you want and uh, that's the beauty of it. So I'm trying to, 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 to see how the uniqueness and, and the, the special form of space can be actually imported to our cities. And I know that I don't want to enforce it. Actually, I don't want to force such form on the people, but at least among us, among certain group of people, we have the chance to create such, fo such form of space, a space that actually can transform itself at the moment. It can be a nightclub in one second, and it can be then a hideout for, uh, for I'm, I'm talking extreme, a hideout for people who are hunted by Israeli. So that's the, that's the purpose of my uh, residency, and that's the purpose of my PhD and my work right now, exploration for space. So this picture where you see right now, it's, it's actually a very, uh, because I told you I was in the party and I saw uh, the people attacking the bank. It was a newly established Safa Bank in Ramallah. And near it, it was uh, Al Carmel Hotel that is new. And they are, actually they are, uh, Carmel Hotel is uh, in Ramallah right now. If you see it, it's the highest building. It's actually declared something. At night, you stand there and you see from all around Ramallah, 
this huge new building that is, has a beautiful light and it, declare, and it declares a project, declares the project to the city. And uh, seeing that at night uh, and seeing uh, the, the bank attacked, uh, I start to experiment with, with what's going on. So uh, this is the picture of uh, the two buildings together at night uh, because that's what I'm aiming to. I'm aiming to represent space actually in terms of uh, the liquidity. And I thought the best uh, best picture to do so, the best form of to do so is to overlap different forms, different times and different lights over, over the time and see what's going on. And this is the declaration of the first, this is the project of the Palestinian Authority, I, I believe, or the pro, pro, I don't want to say Palestinian Authority, it's the project of the city. Uh, and this, I just, I, I was supposed and uh, I was supposed to talk and uh, <coughs> think, but then I didn't. This is the Kalandia refugee camp during the Trump demonstration, which is transformed into another thing. I mean, you can see that sometimes there's demonstration, sometimes there's wedding, sometimes, and all takes forms in the street, you know, the street. And actually it was the case and the city of the, of most of the Palestinian city, that was the case in it. I mean, I keep giving this example, like, uh, People nowadays, they are getting much more annoyed about the traffic in Ramallah. And because you get stuck, you have to go in the morning and blah, blah, blah. And I think it's all part of a new project. Because in the past, our time also was, was I mean, you can, hear, you can know, I mean, that Arabs have, they don't have specific time. It's not, I mean, I don't want to play on cliches, but we used to have our own uh, means of negotiation with space. I mean, if a guy stopped in the streets, and put the four flasher light in the streets, you just pass by him. You can curse at him, but it's normal in our daily life that a guy stops in the street. It's fine. But recently, and because we are being introdu introduced to a very new liberal, highly new liberal system, our time becomes, becomes uh, means money. So you have to work from eight to five, and if you come late to work, you have to uh, stay more late. Otherwise, it's deducted from your salary, that after that you cannot pay. You cannot pay uh, your... Uh, debt on the bank and stuff like this. So people are demanding that our cities can accommodate our new liberal forms of lifestyle. And actually, I cannot say that the city of Ramallah right now is the product of uh, corporate. No, it's the product of people. People, they want this because they are adopting slowly, slowly new liberal life. So they want the freedom of having a transportation system that goes for them at eight and come, uh, that goes every 10 minutes. They want that freedom. And, 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 and that's, that, that's the way where our cities were drifting apart. And that's the way where uh, Cities and refugee camps, they drifted apart. I mean, now, if you want to do an event in Ramallah, you have to take, a, a, what do you call this, a permit from the municipality, or you have to be assigned a proper space, blah, 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 which was not the case. So everything started to become more and more defined in terms of urban spatial uh, regulation. Unlike the camp, the camp is a very, high, as I said, high, very highly temporal place that anything could take place there at any moment. With, um, um, maybe I'm exaggerating a lot, but, that's at least the nature of the space. Uh, this is a Khalandi refugee camp. You can see this is a very recent photo, and you can see that uh, how this, uh, Khaldun was talking about Kufr Aqab. This is Kufr Aqab. Like, it's uh, merging with the camp. It's a weird place. I mean, really, I mean, if you want to see weird things, you have to go to that, to that place. Uh, so within the spaces of the camp, you start to realize that, uh, like, this is a very nice example of how the space is liquid in the camp. Like, during, uh, I think, to last year, the water, uh, there was a lot of rain, not, not last year, the year before, there was a lot of rain, and the rain uh, took the wall down, and suddenly, uh, near, it was in Shafat refugee camp, and so th those uh, kids, see what they have done, like, they just went out on the security road, outside the wall that was fallen, and they started playing football, you know, like, for, and, 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 and they just started playing football there, until the Israeli army came and, and just kicked everybody out. I mean, that's what I'm saying about the liquidity of uh, the space. I mean, the space is once a security wall. People got the opportunity to play uh, kids, not because they don't have uh, football. There is a huge uh, football ground in uh, Khalandia refugee camp that actually is sponsored by Real Madrid. Like last time I came, there was a picture of Cristiano Ronaldo in the Khalandia refugee camp. I don't know why. But I mean, not because they don't have. Uh, they have, but they have the liberty to do so. They can reclaim the space in a moment. And this woman, her house, I don't think it was destroyed by anything. I just think it's unfinished. I don't think if you can see her. Oh, you cannot see her here. But uh, she's, she's here. I mean, she, it's, the house is unfinished, but she was using, uh, use, she was putting uh, her laundry, uh, cleaning her laundry, put it to, to dry from the sun. I mean, it's not, it's, I'm not saying that this is what we want. I'm not saying, I'm just saying the approach toward the space. I'm not going to 
build, uh, I'm not going to import a dis the destroyed house and fabric toward our cities and say this is our mean. No, I'm saying that the way people approach the space is actually a very resilient way, you know? Like, yeah, we can use anything, we can convert everything. We don't wait for architects and urban planners to come and tell us that way we should walk. We can maneuver around this. We create our own dynamics in our space. And actually, yeah, it's very dangerous, actually. I mean, now there is a safety concern now in uh, the new elite uh, class from Allah. Uh, some people, we were talking about outside, there are people who are concerned about safety. Some people are moving to the city of Rawabi because they are more safe than Ramallah. I don't know what is it. So, uh, uh, what we see here, in my, she just used it, and that's it. And this guy, he's uh, doing his own pigeons while he's having a living room for his friends. Sometimes pigeons, sometimes living room, sometimes whatever. And uh, this is not important, I think, so much. But it's, it's about the story of uh, Khaled, the guy who's handicapped, and uh, the way he was ex explaining the different forms, how, he, how his house, and a very... Uh, uh, detailed level how his house he can enter access from the from the window so uh, the main door became a storage and he organized all his plan around things so the window became a door and then the, the, he changed it to a storage so he have a, his own perception that he only can see you know that that's the beauty about it and this is the kind of living room that in the camp it's, it's a whole network you know so the the, the space it's, it's not confined anymore with boundaries and it's not confined with time so. A, a, a space that can be liquid, you know, even if it's a living room now, it could be anything later. And so this is what I'm doing uh, at the moment. And thank you. Thank you very much, Akman. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's it's interesting now to to pass to Alpers. Like actually, uh, yesterday evening over the fantastic dinner that we took part in, we were talking uh, with Alper on how like these uh, these different temporalities can actually apply to his work and this uh, sort of like open programmatic spaces uh, that were described by uh, Akbar in the living room can be approached in uh, Alper's work uh, uh, starting from the materiality. So like the disability in the in the camp that reconfigure space can become like uh, a true uh, bodily experience when it comes to the application of uh, 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 and the, let's say the perception of the specific materials that are used in your work. I think uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. First off, um, before I start, I think I have to say after um, coming here and it was a quite spontaneous um, endeavor that we were that I was able to join to be here for the workshop and thank you very much Ika that it was possible I'm very happy it was uh, really amazing all the input and the conversations of the last days and um, but also this presentation is very spontaneous because I'm filling in, filling in as you heard and I have to say also in relation to uh, Ahmad's presentation just now and also in regards to the other projects that were presented over this or the, the, the discourses that we talked about. Um, a lot of this overlaps with our practice in a way, but our practice is of course highly localized in Central Europe, in Germany, in uh, a very different um, political and social situation. So I just kind of want to put this as a disclaimer because it, a lot of the topics that I'm going to talk about are, uh, are going to be parallel and it's, it felt strange to me when I prepared this presentation. So, just this. Um, Umschichten, that's our name uh, for everybody so you know how it's written because it's hard to spell in English. Um, first off, this is a kind of a graphic illustration of our material approach that Simon was uh, talking about also. So, at the point A, we are uh, it's the material in its original form, so it's uh, at home, so to say. Um, you're going to see later on in the project. Um, and it's basically on the way to, uh, to be used in, its, in, its, uh, in the way that it was meant to be used. Um, that's where we step in and we put a little staircase and take it to another level and um, introduce this moment of B, so it's like another um, form of storing the material and adding um, another value to the material for a short amount of time. 
And in the end, as you see, it's, there is a descent from this mountain and we return to A. So just this very quickly from the beginning, you're going to see later on. Um, I'm going to start off with the project, um, the Ostang project that we did in uh, Darmstadt in the Matildenhöhe. It was a summer school and this is what we built. Um, I'm starting deliberately off with this um, illustration that we did afterwards. We document our projects in this classical architectural form only after we are done with them because we um, plan most of our projects while we are constructing them. So what you see is a very abstract building. It's um, what we call um, um, a storage of building materials. So here is a little impression from the construction project. So it was a summer school for architecture students from all around the world and we had a small group of students and we borrowed from a supplier of construction materials one truckload, more or less, of different materials. So here, the metal buckets you see, they are um, irrigation systems. The white plastic um, part you see, it's a system for building uh, windows beneath ground. And then the yellow part is, of course, a, um, a storage shelving system. Um, so what, we, what our task was, was to create an entrance to this um, to this area where other architects uh, were working on other workshops and creating other uh, pavilions. And our um, task was to create this info bridge, what we called it. So you're entering the, the area and at the same time you're being informed about the current programs and the daily uh, things. So um, here in this illustration you can see basically what we did. So there's the material in its original form, in the way that it was stored at the suppliers, uh, in the yard of the supplier. And we take it with a lot of people and we rearrange it into this um, other form of a storage for a short amount of time and we take it apart in the end again. It becomes uh, the same material and it goes back into its original cycle. Um, so yeah, here you see a little bit of the construction and this was a very picture that we like to use. I'm going to skip because I'm, going, I'm trying to not to take too much time. Um, the next project is a similar approach in a different context. This was at, uh, at the Bauhaus in Dessau. We were invited to do an exhibition design for uh, the exhibition Große Pläne, Great Big Plans, maybe. I don't know what the translation was. Um, and the Bauhaus, of course, I'm sorry that I'm bringing on a Bauhaus project, but it was fitting for this context. I, every, all of us probably heard enough this year. Um, so this was our uh, resource this time. Again, we, had a, a, we set up a collaboration with a local dealer of um, industrial goods, basically. So our projects are, in this sense, um, always highly localized because we are looking for these kind of collaborations with uh, with local producers or storers, maybe in the best sense. So this were, were, um, was a, a, a retailer of plastic parts. These are again for underground construction like canalizations and these kinds of things. So we built a model, we also do that. So we do to some extent um, planning ahead, but we keep it quite open. So we uh, made a, a collection of the different part, parts that we had and we were started to play around in the model. We made also this, um, this collections, one of our co-workers uh, um, categorizing and um, catalog, uh, making a catalog of, of the different elements that we found in the storage of the, of the museum, of, of the Bauhaus, and also the things that we borrowed. So there's like aluminum sheets, there's these plastic parts, but there's also like a, a uh, chessboard where we were joking, uh, who knows who has played on this chessboard, so maybe it's important for to show it in the exhibition. Um, and we set up this laboratory in the, in, in the museum, so during the time where usually the workers would come and put up drywalls and start constructing on the plans of the architects, we go ourselves and we uh, make this team of, there's our graphic designer, there's Wukash, my colleague, uh, two interns and one of the technicians of the, um, of the museum and we bring all the materials and we bring the knowledge of the weeks that we kind of learned by uh, playing on the, uh, on the models and such and um, we start setting up tests. Ooh. 
Um, okay. Um, so we touched the material and we tried to find out its properties and how to connect it and what possibilities we have and how we can accomplish the needs also in this case of, an, of, a, of a scenography for an exhibition. Um, this is a very dear uh, element of ours, these clamps that we use a lot and we also have a lot of them because we, we love them. <laughs> um, so these are all kind of prototypes that we went through over the process. Um, these, sh these stripes of MDF were left over from the previous exhibition, so also something that we talked about with Ika for the approach for, for this edition here. And so in the end, this is what, uh, what the exhibition looked like. And again, this was the point um, after we were done, after we came back to the office, after everybody uh, regenerated their batteries. Uh, one of our um, lucky interns got the task of reconstructing from uh, photos and of course their experience also the plans and this digital model of the, uh, of the project to document and also to, um, to, yeah, to make the, the, the things that we learned about these materials uh, more permanent. So here are some impressions, and you see the connections, they seem, uh, it seems uh, a little bit complicated, but all of these connections are made in a way so the material is not hurt. So this is really a mantra that we uh, say over and over, we don't hurt the materials because they are borrowed and we're giving them back and there's a form of trust that we are uh, asking from the suppliers of the materials. So... This was also a, a really a nice uh, collaboration with the curators because they were also, of course, challenged to work with this kind of um, very um, uncertain and um, speculative mode of um, installing their works or organizing their works in the space. And then uh, I'm just going to show one more project. This is kind of like the, a durational project that's been going on from uh, 2008, excuse me, um, until today. <coughs> and this is our office, our own office in Stuttgart. Uh, some of you have seen it, uh, where you have visited us. And I'm just going to go th quickly through the story of this, uh, of this office, because it also describes a lot of the principles that we work with in, uh, our, uh, in our general practice. So this was the first form of the office. We were based in Stuttgart in a former industrial hangar that was used to repair, uh, repair trains and buses, uh, and which was uh, not used anymore. And so it was uh, given to a cultural center or a cultural <laughs> venue where they do concerts and stuff, and a bigger part was given to, uh, to a, a group of artists that were setting up their um, workshops and um, studios there. When uh, Lukas and Peter entered this uh, area, there was one corner of this hall that, was, that nobody wanted, and it was this uh, corner where this shelf was inside. So this gray shelf was set up in the way it was, uh, in the way you see it here. And this was the place where the, um, the company that was repairing the buses, they were uh, storing all the spare parts and such. And um, we had also a material from, uh, again, from an exhibition, recycled material with it was plywood modules. So the first um, office was this box on top of the shelf. So we were kind of hidden. We could use the shelf as an access, accessing system to get on top of the shelf and then into this little box. Um, it was very hot in the summer. So at one point, um, there was an opportunity to move within the hall. There were reconstructions going on. Um, and so we moved the whole uh, shelf 20 meters to one side. So we kind of divided it into, its, into these um, slices and we took them with the forklift and we just pulled them 20 meters along and um, built the second version, which was this. It looks a lot like a f fortress because um, some of you know, maybe if you work in a collaborative space with other artists, you have to also have some kind of protection against um, too much <laughs> exposure. Um, and so this is the vision, uh, the view inside. So we shifted from being on top of the office, uh, on top of the shelf, 
uh, to being inside the shelf um, in like a multi-functional space which is storage, office, kitchen and everything at the same time. Um, also we had a, a bigger courtyard where we could um, work in the summer outside a little bit and use it also for um, experimenting and working on, on materials. Um, then the next step was that the, that the hangar is in reconstruction right now. It's being renovated for uh, fire safety, of course. Um, and so all of us, we had to move outside of the hangar and right now we are in front uh, in a, like a container city. And we, of course, uh, it was clear for us that we would not leave our beloved shelf inside um, to be destroyed. So we dismantled it completely and moved it outside. And this is our current state. So it's a combination basically of uh, also in the other project, the first project that you saw. So the yellow shelves that I showed in the first project in combination with the containers that came from another project uh, and the gray shelving system that our first two offices were made of um, now formed like the, the third iteration of the office. So, um, yeah, there's a little illustration you could see. Um, I'm going to jump quickly two steps ahead. So these are like this, this is like the all the steps that we took over the years with the office and this really illustrates also and it connects to what you said Ahmad also um, this is really something that we're highly interested in to uh, build architecture in a way that it's never finished and that it's always in, uh, in flux and the materials are in flux and um, uh, the, that we kind of avoid permanence in this way and are able to react to different situations and different needs and um, always live in a, um, in a state of uh, spatial emergency maybe and uh, remember my disclaimer from my head when I use these terms. Um, so and we, what we also do in the documentation, what we love to do is to imagine uh, these buildings afterwards in a more phantasmic way. So um, extending them, adding more material than we have uh, um, and imagining it also in regards to what I just said, like being built on the other side, being dismantled on the other side, being used in the middle and all of this being like a machine that kind of moves through time and space. Um, I'm going to jump quickly back because this is one thing we talked about this yesterday. This is um, uh, the entrance to our current office and this is uh, a good illustration also of another principle that is uh, really important to me or to us as an office. This is uh, the staircase that we used to get into the office. So uh, it's, um, it's an old staircase that we found in the hangar many years ago and we weren't using it and now that the situation was that the uh, actual office space is on top it was perfect to use it and uh, you have to use this uh, ladder which has only a rail on one side uh, and which is probably not um, legal anymore to use um, and then on top step onto this situation where there is no handlebar and you only have this one stick and then you have to kind of reach or um, feel secure about your step and this is something that uh, is also um, in all the other projects that you saw, a principle that is important for us, this responsibility that you take for your own actions um, in, uh, in the way that you move through spaces and in the way that you use architecture and also urban space, that you realize that not everything around you is uh, insurable and safe and taken care of, but you have to be aware of your surroundings and make um, make decisions what your next step is going to be and what the dangers of your next step could be. Um, yeah, I'm just going to finish on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alper, for this very sensitive approach towards like materials that they don't have to be armed in any way <laughs> in the process. Joanna, please. completely out of sync with the uh, predecessors. 
because, um, yeah, I should have been on a different panel. Um, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is also actually about the space and uh, temporality. But I would like to, um, before I uh, speak about Mohammed Badwan and his collection of stones uh, in Ramallah, um, I would like to repeat something that already happened in uh, our private conversations that the uh, uh, Palestine I remember from 10, 20 years ago um, is not there anymore. And I felt, um, in a sense, I didn't have a ground. I didn't know where I was actually anymore when I uh, came to Ramallah for not such a long time. And this, of course, was another limitation in my recognition of this country again that um, the economical bubble, the, the sense of the temporality, kind of a permanent sense of instability is, uh, is totally destructive. Um, and um, it made me look for something that was graspable, palpable, something that could be actually described in a very kind of material terms. And um, I think this is why I chose this, uh, the, the, the desire actually of this particular person, uh, Mohammed Badwan, to actually dwell into. And um, um, I, a couple of uh, more words about why it, it, it has been chosen for actually a project I would describe Palestine now as I see it. Uh, is that because I'm entirely focused on the matter, on the, how people actually relate to matter, especially around them. Uh, and this kind of space in between, between the, our immediate surroundings, the landscape and the, the, the things we use, the space we use, uh, the way we create tension is actually, I think, quite important. And uh, when I happened to, to be in this shop, it's a, it's a normal shop where Mohammed should sell milk and yogurt and, um, and bread, and he actually has a collection of the stones on the shelves, literally stopped me. Uh, it is not unusual. I mean, he's, um, he's well known in Ramallah, and I think many people use his passion and his stories, uh, and he's, uh, he's kind of a um, very well-known kind of weirdo, which is uh, a, a local guru. Uh, what I found really amazing is that this, uh, he has a personal uh, story and personal attachment to each stone separately. And for, the, for him, they are living entities with the story, with the faces, with the uh, um, kind of inner life. And uh, I, think, I thought this is uh, quite amazing. Um, because actually what he does with the space between him and the stones is to, in a way, demonize them. You know, he does see demons in them. For them, they are living things with the stories. And of course, when we think about it, each of the stone has a, um, a scale of time that is beyond our human scale. And that made me think about um, the lost links with the reality, which is not only the Palestinian phenomena, uh, which is very palpable there, but it's generally the legacy of modernism that we went through. And that made me look for the ties, exactly, the, the missing links. Um, and I thought that the pre-Zionist uh, Palestine would be the answer. So I started to, to read Tufik Kanan, who was a physician and um, ethnographer and who was particularly interested exactly in the demons. And those two uh, traits, the love for the stones, he calls them uh, fossils, they're actually not fossils, they're just stones. But anyway, the love for the stones and the uh, stories about the demons, classified, described, found by, the, uh, by this physician, Tofik Kanan, kind of came together in one project. And one more thing about Muhammad Badwan and his collection. Each stone is found by himself. So he had to kind of bend his body, pick it up, look at it, and uh, feel, kind of feel through that stone, in a sense, uh, give it a personality. I think this is a very particular uh, 
relationship with the matter. And this is exactly how the demons are created, because of course this is, this is the creation that kind of electrifies reality, gives it the life, and, uh, and also makes it into partners, agents, something that is our partner, they're not just resources at this point. So I thought this is, uh, this is absolutely it. No, he's in the city of Ramallah. You must know him. Yeah. Like he has the same, he has a supermarket with a lot of rocks inside. Yeah. But he's, okay. But, <laughs> okay, it might be, might be more of them. As you see, he has a chart with the uh, description of the fossils, but um, as I said, it has nothing to do with the fossils. Anyway, what it came, that's the shop. And that's the, uh, at first, I really didn't know what to do with them, so I started simply to draw them. I haven't been drawing for years and years, so this is uh, kind of uh, Indian ink. And, uh, but that gave me a clue that these are actually uh, persons, yeah, entities, living entities, living beings, in a sense, uh, materialized in Muhammad Badwan's stories. That one should be vertical, I think. Anyway, and um, and then that was this Palestinian um, uh, a journal of the Palestinian Oriental Society, and that's the series. It's just 20 photographs. And what, what I did, I, I, I'm not a good photographer, so I came back to Palestine with the photographer, an analog camera, just a Hasselblad. And, um, and then I reprinted um, the, uh, the Tofik Kanan uh, text about the springs and demons. And it kind of became a narrative. So we know that the planets in whose hands human fortune and misfortune lie were divided by all Semitic races of antiquity and are still by the Palestinian into good and bad planets. This is Muhammad Badwan and his wife who is an absolute angel. He forgave him absolutely everything including the fact that he sleeps alone in the back of the shop with his stones. <laughs> the two bad planets are Mars and Saturn but the latter is not his most ill omened one. Uh, Muhammad told me that these are actually fruits, uh, but I saw planets in them. This is the back of the shop. The gene, which is the demon. Demons live in the first place in the interior of the earth once they come out. And, yeah, once they come out. Uh, I don't know the Hebrew, and I don't know the Syriac, and I don't know the Arabic, but anyway, these are the words which describe it and illustrate this. But I'm sure one of, some of you do. The spirits, to whatever category they belong, appear as all the demons only during the night and in the dusk. They also are only to be seen when a lonely traveler passes by as they never like to face several human beings at once. Many of them try to injure the passerby by frightening him with their noise, shape or misbehavior. If they attack him, he gets sick or may even die. They come from the lower world and therefore we meet them generally in places which have a direct connection with the lower regions. Trees whose roots go down into in the interior of the earth, cracks, caves, springs and wells which have a direct or indirect connection with the above uh, named original abode of the demons. Yeah, that one is beautiful. Loneliness, desertedness, darkness, cracks, caves, canals, trees combined with the spring assure the habitation of that place. For every object with such a situation is thereby a favorite abiding place of the spirits, since it has on the one hand a direct communication with the interior of the earth, and on the other, and on the other hand belongs to the planet Saturn. 
And as these demons are blind and deaf, they do not yet know that their master, King Solomon, has died, and dreading his punishment, they still continue to work. These spirits are almost always described as having a majestic stature and a charming form, wearing beautiful clothes and costly adornments. One may, re may recognize the jean ladies from their eyes. The pupils are perpendicularly elongated. If, on the other hand, he commits adultery with such a female jean, he is lost. These females have a particular inclination to human beings, following and imploring them to come and live with them. The jean jean, I guess, anyway, the female jean, employs sometimes different tricks to entangle men. In the case of that one, the passerby observes at times a black she-goat. It is believed by some that if a human being has the exceptional chance of catching one of these chickens, it will change at once into a lump of gold. He fell in love with her and gently approaching her, begged her to accept him as a lover. As she showed no inclination towards him, despite all his requests, he committed suicide by cutting his throat as he could live no longer without the enticing creature. In 24 cases, the spirits are good. Four of them are Christian saints. 29 are Mohammedan wellies. An exception is the camel, which always represents a bad demon. Even in the explanations of dreams given by the Fellahin, I guess, at present, camels are always a bad omen. And some of them are in meditation and saints, while some of them roam around the source they pray. And that's a particular story, maybe too long to read. And up to the present day, we meet with the names, with names for the demons which point to their origin. And they are spirits, subterranean um, spirits, and hellish spirits. So there's a classification. This is the, the last one. So I actually thought that this is, um, I mean, the key to actually Muhammad Badwan and his mind in which the whole idea was born, actually, that the uh, Tufik Kanan uh, texts are um, absolutely, absolutely the best match to create the, um, the, the, exactly the missing link that I thought that the Palestine needs so much at the moment. I'm not sure if if I'm right, but that's my uh, shy attempt to um, kind of touch it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, I will allow myself to open up like the Q&A, the questions to, uh, to, our, to our speakers. And uh, I, I would start with uh, Hamad, as uh, we were talking uh, uh, last night and very much about this, uh, his uh, peculiar distinction between uh, 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 what he calls temporary and what he calls uh, uh, temporal in the, in the definition of what's going on in the, uh, in the camps. And I would like to ask you to expand a little bit on the on how this feature of that we've seen also expressed, like this notion of time, we, we've seen expressed uh, in different ways through the other presentation, and this impermanence that we discussed about yesterday, and this fluidity, this constant change that you try to portray it in your in your work uh, through different medias, how this impermanence can be a tool, sort of, that, or something that we can learn from in order to uh, react to what's going on in, uh, in the, the everyday changing of the Ramallah uh, city as we've been 
we heard it described as a, uh, incredibly, uh, like, as Ioana couldn't even uh, recognize the city for how much it changed for the worse of a certain kind of, uh, uh, like, neoliberal market economy driven sort of space, which is rather permanent and very defined. So how we can crack through that with using learning from the uh, so I th the, the, the thing is, with permanence comes uh, easiness. Easiness in the sense that it's easier to occupy us if we are permanent. It's easier to occupy us if, 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 if the, those political structures, meaning the Zionist Israelis, uh, uh, are aware of where we are, where we live, are aware of our spaces. I mean, I think during the first intifada, they hired an architect. The Israeli army hired an architect, uh, and they did a report on the old city of Nablus on how actually to infiltrate it because it's so it was so hard to infiltrate the city of Nablus. So they hired an architect, an urban planner. Our city is right now in Palestine, and due to different circumstances, including us as Palestinians, like I, I'm, I'm not saying just because we are a victim of the political structures. No, us ourselves are, are, are transforming our cities into this permanent infrastructure where our things are defined. It's defined where to walk. It's defined where to where to uh, where to have recreational things is so defined where to eat everything in our cities are, are being uh, defined and it makes it easier to occupy us make it easier to identify us now it's easy for the Israeli armies to come to Ramallah and just take anybody because they know where is Al Manara Square they know where is everything happening I know I mean uh, and, 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 and such things, I mean, I, maybe I gave you the example yesterday of this institutionalization of space also happens on, on not only on space on everything like uh, and it's been painted with those nationalistic kind of forms about resistance and about the future state of Palestine. Uh, they're building a new, uh, a new uh, uh, project in Jericho called Nur Ariha, the, 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 the light of Jericho. So it's like a solar balance oriented kind of uh, project. They uh, will generate 1.5 megawatt of uh, electricity through solar panels. And the Palestinian Authority has been bragging about it since long. It was funded by uh, one of the most uh, uh, a fund, uh, new investment, Palestinian investment fund, uh, uh, and they think it's a strategic subject that will actually help the Palestinian to to decrease the independence on the Israeli electricity. And and, and this project is actually in Jericho, and, and, and you know, like it's, it's a very institutional project. So there is those funders, and there is those uh, CEOs, and there's this all kind of people that they, they manage it. And in times of crisis, I believe such project will, 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 will despair, like it will not function anymore. Such project, they need maintenance, you know, and, and with the collapse of an institution, like as we've seen happened in the first or in the second intifada, at least, like an institution that didn't exist anymore, like it was hiding, like Abu Ammar was surrounded in his uh, al-Muqata. So with the collapse of the institution, and it could happen at any time, I'm not saying that it, 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 it should happen. No, it could happen. Such projects will never function and will never benefit us. So uh, what I was saying that such projects they should have the quality of impermanency. They should be. They should have a social root. They should be within the social uh, relay, not within the institutional relay. And I saw that in the camp. I I, I was thinking that rather than uh, such project be implemented uh, by institution, the money should have been to people, and they should help people to build those uh, uh, solar panels all around refugee camps, the West Bank, in Gaza. Uh, it will make it harder to 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 uh, to, to corrupt or to to. Uh, to uh, destroy such projects when it's in the hands of people. It will make it at least harder, you know? They can do it still, but it will make it at least harder for them. Why do we make uh, our occupation uh, easier? Why do we make our occupation cheaper? I mean, we are, this is our agency. And in that sense, I saw that in the camp, they still make the occupation, uh, it's, they still occupied, but they make it hard occupation, you know? Uh, Israeli army, they, they pay a lot of attention before going in the, in the camp. Uh, any decision about the camp, it, it will be discussed so much before an intervention happened because the space in the camp is impermanent. Anything could be expected from it. It's like the old city of Nablus. They were saying to us, nobody were allowed to go to Yasmin uh, neighborhood in Nablus because the guys who were living there, they only know the space. It was a maze. And among this maze, they, they already had the booty trap, booty traps or whatever they call them, prepared for whoever comes inside. The, this imp impermanence is our uh, next solution. I, I don't want our impermanence to be a burden toward us. I don't want us to, uh, to, to live, uh, uh, no, I want to be able to, to create all of our new things, our all uh, recycling, solar energy, panel, women empowerment, all these forms of things. I want to create them in our own terms, in the such impermanence terms, that they can adapt to our nature, to create a temporal identity, an identity that is a result of a moment, that can be rooted in the past, but 
we shouldn't create a new Palestinian state that, uh, that, that believes in the olive tree and the, the mosque and all of these kinds and repeated them in all of these past. We should create a temporal, an impermanent temporal identity. And I think we can find this, we can learn from this in the camp and import it to our cities in the future. To connect with the, with the other two presentations, what do you think about like, how the materiality of the camps could sort of like be um, included in this sense? Like the, we are agents which transform material constantly, we reshape the surface of our planet, we, we reuse materials, we pre-cycle uh, as Alper showed us. What's the condition there that could, uh, you know, sort of enable this impermanence, but from a point of view of, um, of the substance of which the camp is actually made of? What do you think? See, I believe that our cities in Palestine, at least uh, at some point, they were impermanent. They were this form, even though that people, they, they, they were building uh, uh, those uh, little houses that seemed to be permanent, but uh, in general, the, the, the network of the infrastructure and the way that we were perceiving, it was at some sort impermanent. Our markets were impermanent. Our roads, they were functioning in a different way. It was a bit still, there was this sense of impermanency that disappeared after, uh, after the, uh, the, uh, the the emergence of such new uh, institutional uh, political structure that has a, a very particular demand from, uh, the, uh, from its donors. Like the donor, they required them a particular form of special production in order for them to be accepted by, by those donors. So I believe that, I'm not bringing something new, I believe that such impermanence existed in our camps and in our cities, and they were all accommodating this form. I mean, in the movie that Khaldun uh, showed about uh, Ilya Suleiman, uh, such a movie shows uh, the dynamic of the city, of how the city actually works, and it was. But now, definitely disappeared. Like the other day, I was uh, saying, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, the city of Ramallah became uh, uh, such bubble, such such, such weird bubble that uh, that you go there, and actually, it is. It used to be full of contradiction, but now, no, it's just evident. You know, like <coughs> what is there and what is not. It's, it's a, a new, new liberal project. Uh, happening in front of our eyes. And I've always thought that we Palestinians have the chance to create a post-state, a state that is beyond the national symbols. But it, does, it seems like it doesn't happen. And in, 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 like in, since 2007, like we've seen things moving super fast. It's so violent. It's really so violent how, uh, how, how our identity are being formed, our national identity are being formed. And, and, and we still see that uh, Palestinian, when they, they hear the national anthem flag, they stand. When they hear the, see the flag, they, they salute it or they, they stand for it. They, they still have respect for these new symbols that I, 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 I couldn't really understand. I cannot understand anymore. I mean, uh, but I think if you just go back like 20 years ago, and see how our cities were, and just start from there again. I think we can find a beautiful uh, I, I think I can jump to Alpers to connect like one aspect that uh, it's very dear to me, actually, as, a, as in our practice with Centrala, is about how uh, the public space of our cities, and that connects with the, with the Palestine that uh, Hamad was talking about, is nowadays, uh, and now from your uh, European perspective, uh, very predetermined. Like, w as you're saying, you, we don't take responsibilities for what's happening in the public space because the responsibility has been taken care for us by someone else, by uh, entities which are above, and they top down determining how, what we can do, how safe it is to move, and so on and so forth. And I wanted to ask you, like, uh, in, uh, on the light of your projects, like, uh, your projects reconfigurates all the time and use completely different sets of materials all the time. I mean, is this like a, a sort of like a key to break into this uh, boring series that we are aiming at, that Ramallah is becoming? So can we counteract this uh, uh, endless boredom of Central European cities in which, like, everything is how it's supposed to be, in this, in this sense? I mean, I, I really don't want to uh, speak for the situation in Ramallah, of course, because I haven't even been to Palestine or seen any of it. But um, for sure, yeah, I think uh, the, the goal is, or like the didactic goal maybe in our project is for sure this, um, um, to create a, a situation of, of insecurity and um, maybe even fear about your about your safety 
uh, when you're entering this this bridge, you know, this this uh, this entrance pavilion, because it it uh, it wasn't really I, I wasn't pointing to it in the presentation, but it was spanning also over a little uh, dip in the in the geography of the site. So um, and you could see through it. So you were crossing. It, it's not deep. It's 1.5 meters or something. But you're kind of trusting your your safety to this building, which uh, doesn't look like anything that you are that you're used to. It's not um, it's not this um, the classical or this uh, typical um, event event structure architecture. You know, like with rigs and all these things. So. Um, yeah, I think for sure it's this is a this is a big goal. But what I um, one one remark that came up from Ahmad's um, presentation because you showed this uh, the system of the living rooms, which I found uh, c quite quite interesting, also in understanding the um, um, the refugee camp. As, as what it is, and I don't think that so much in the materiality it is it is a factor there because it it is concrete and stones and it's it's very it's very hard to to adapt you know it takes a lot more effort and time of course they do it but it has a maybe a, a slower um, speed but um, this uh, seeing understanding many living rooms as a connected space or as a connected building and understanding all of the um, the, the refugee camp as one architecture and not a collection of many buildings i think this is an, a very interesting interesting point that you were that you were making with this illustration also um, and i think this is maybe this could be related to our situation in the situation where we work in, in, in Germany and in, in Europe. Um, this is of course a goal, but a lot of the projects, I think I was telling you yesterday, a lot of our projects, um, they happen so fast that they are, that we are just quicker than the regulators. So they don't, they never, until they have our application on their table, we are already disappeared. So it, uh, it works in different, in different, Themes. And I think it's beautiful in this context that Joanna introduced like uh, another like concept, another sense of time, which is the geological time, somehow which is like atemporal in a sense because it's so long that we cannot even conceptualize it. And somehow when we dig out out stones, somehow we dig out like our innermost fears, which are demons, and and uh, they basically they they reveal what we did to the land and how the land kind of react on us and gonna survive us anyway. So I don't know if you and I want to share uh, with us like some other uh, you know where this project comes from in from your history, personal history. How do you, did you arrive to this? Um, <laughs> Um, through rubbish, actually, <laughs> because um, yeah, I didn't want to talk about it really. But that what what um, what is striking in Palestine now is the amount of waste. I mean, this whole acceleration produced amazing amounts. I mean, amazing, horrible amount of waste. And of course, uh, the management of the waste is also a subject of actually apartheid segregation, uh, but not only, and that's the problem. Because if this was just done by Israelis, that we would have a straight answer why we kind of swim in rubbish. And the iconic olive trees, garden orchards, yeah, gardens, yeah, are just completely covered with plastic. Um, which is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, and that was a sign for me. I mean, I didn't research, I'm not the research artist. I don't do research-based projects. If I, if I was, I probably would dive into it because it is fascinating. The materiality of rubbish, the amount of it. There's something that actually, if you think, <laughs> you know, in terms of, in, in scale of, geological time is going to cover us <laughs> soon. <laughs> Not only in Palestine, everywhere else. I mean, of course, we know that we already created a sediment, a plastic sediment. But anyway, uh, the, the fact that the ground disappears and then we do not have the direct 
direct access to it that we don't see it anymore. You know, we don't see, we see the, what's on it, which is rubbish. Uh, made me think about people, whether there are people who actually look down what's under their feet and whether they feel it, they feel the connection anymore. Because, you know, I mean, I absolutely adore the, uh, the, the, the rocky Palestinian ground. We don't have it here. And the, the, the view, you know, in springtime when it gets this kind of a little greenish um, kind of tone and then when it dies because it's too, too dry, this is amazing. This is kind of a primeval landscape. And this also disappears. Even the landscape disappears under the, the waste especially when the, they build the settlements and the, the amount of industrial rubbish is just overwhelming. So therefore, I, I, the finding um, Mohammed Badwan was like, I mean, a really revelation that there's someone for whom there is a pure landscape and a pure, you know, kind of matter un, under the, uh, his feet. So that's, that's it. Great. And that's the time for the public to have some questions. Maybe. Bogna. Um, okay, I have a question to Ahmad. During the war in Warsaw, the Second World War, architects and urbanists were thinking about rebuilding the city after the war. What will happen when the war will be finished and the enemies will be gone? And the question is, is there any initiatives that grabs your energy, imagination, and capability to create a positive plan for what to do after the Israelis will be gone? Yeah. Now, are there any you know, projects that connect you and um, in terms of um, you know, efforts to plan what will happen when you know you 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 don't um, you don't need to be in a constant uh, ping pong with uh, with what is happening because of the Israel. There will be a time when you know the situation will be changed. And my question is: Are there any initiatives that are planning, you know, the urban development of Palestine? <coughs> not in reaction to what Israel is doing. I mean, I believe that what Israel is doing and what the PA is doing is our current identity. I mean, uh, the other day I heard that... Uh, then you are inseparable. We are inseparable. I mean, how come we can separate ourselves? I mean, how come we can plan a future without Israel right now? And that's what I was talking about. That's what I was talking about, uh, having an identity that is uh, very temporal. I mean, we are. I mean. We are, as Palestinian, we are trying to create uh, a new national identity that has uh, its particular symbols, you know? And I believe that this is very bizarre as our different realities as Palestinians who lives in the diaspora, who lives in the camp, who lives in the village, who lives in Ramallah, who lives, and the classism that's happening right now, each of us has a very, very, very different reality. How come we can say that uh, a person in the, in the, in the, in the refugee camp uh, in Jordan or in uh, Kalandia can identify with the olive tree, the same one who owns land as a peasant up the north from Allah. How come they both, they should have the same symbolism? I mean, that's what I'm talking about, the, the current uh, liquid identity that based on individual, individual realities. The camp is a reality right now and it's very much entwined with the, with, with, with the uh, What's happening with the Israeli occupation? Why should we separate and why should we plan a future without Israel? It might never happen. That's why what I'm saying, our products should be the result of the moment. And that's why the, where come the impermanence. Because we don't know what will happen, everything can change. And everything can change actually. Uh, uh, and we can deal with that when the things change. You know, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, we are not in the place to construct an identity that is permanent right now. We are not in that place. I don't think we have, we need to do so. We are people under occupation, and we need to always know that we are under occupation. It's, 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 it's currently, if we choose to ignore that fact, that fact, it's up to individuals to ignore that fact. Like, but as as a people together, we are. We should always remind ourselves of that fact. And so that's why I don't actually believe that we should plan for the removal of the Israeli state. Uh, I mean, I don't believe in uh, in such thing. I, th I know that there is a lot of people doing so right now, 
But I mean, I don't believe in such things. Thank you. I have a comment uh, for Joanna and a question for Ahmed. Uh, the comment uh, for Joanna is, um, I found your drawings fascinating of the stones and their correspondence to the demons of Canaan um, are very original, although I'm not sure Canaan would resonate with them. And the name Canaan keeps coming back. It reminds me of um, the um, diary of Malinowski, who's a Polish anthropologist, whose diary was published after he died. His demons were the people he was describing. I don't know if you're familiar with his diary, but Canaan published a diary which, uh, sorry, he wrote a diary, a daily diary, which was published two years ago. And in this diary, we find a total lack of resonance with his ethnographic material, because he talks about the demons in the same way that Malinowski dreams of his demons, who are the people. And Canaan's demons are also the people he's describing. So it's very interesting to look at um, his demonology in the light of his diary. The, the, there are two worlds apart, and um, I'm not saying it's a, a negative thing or a positive, it just compels us to rethink what he's talking about. And I think your uh, interpretation of these stones will be very much um, deconstructed, perhaps, if you, if you look at these diaries. Um, can I ask a question to Ahmed, or do you want me to? Okay. I found Ahmed's uh, narrative very interesting, but also very confusing. Uh, you seem to seek a world of imper impermanence, which you describe as existing in reality as a positive thing because, and here's my question, is it because it's a kind of anarchic existence that allows us to survive in this world of crisis or because you want to confuse the Israelis who are seeking to rationalize our life or maybe both? I mean, your, your description of impermanence seems to find its dream situation in, in refugee camps. But this kind of, your enemy seems to be bourgeois smugness, which is emanating from the new rationality of planning that is being introduced by the neoliberal economy. But it's exactly this impermanence that drives people mad. I mean, it, it, it literally drives them to leave the country. So uh, what is it that you're saying? I don't understand. Is it something we should seek or that it exists anywhere we should just live with it? What, what are you saying? No, I, 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 I believe that uh, what is happening in our city right now should be reversed. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, we should bring the refugee camp to the city. I'm saying that uh, uh, the condition of our production now in the current times in our city uh, is following uh, a direction that makes our life seems that we are not under occupation while we do, we are very aware that we are, we are under, uh, I mean maybe it seems like we are not but I mean yeah. So what I see that within those refugee camps and I'm not traumatizing them and you're very true that uh, where I come from it comes from this the product of this new liberal uh, Bubble from Allah, exactly, which I'm trying so, really trying so hard to, uh, to, to, to remove myself from it, but it doesn't seem to work. I mean, you have to lose yourself to do so. And, uh, but uh, what I say that in the refugee camps, we find, uh, we find means of production of the space that have the capability of accommodation, accommodating the modern forms of lifestyle within such impermanence. That would allow what that that's the result of the occupation. In such sense, I'm saying that we should develop our cities, but we should develop our cities in the way that have this character of impermanence uh, 
uh, for the sake of uh, of the force force of occupation. Because, uh, as you said, as maybe it's both of it. It's the fact that uh, it makes our occupation cheap, uh, more expensive. I think it makes our space more resilient. It's a space that can actually take any different form, any different time. It is a space that's more resilient than a space that is very much defined and very much known. Like I, I, I was talking today, and I was saying that uh, uh, it could happen. Like uh, if if a third intifada happens in, in Palestine, and uh, by any chance Israel. Uh, uh, drop some bombs on Ramallah, eventually all the glass building of Ramallah, they will collapse and by themselves, they will transform to those forms of impermanent structures by themselves. Maybe we need to wait for things to happen by themselves. Maybe I don't need to import things into the camp because I believe that most of the building in Ramallah that have glass, uh, they will just appear by themselves. The glass will go down. I mean, the, Khattan, the new Khattan foundation, it will be destroyed by itself. And it will become an impermanent space, a structure that is people seek for different use. And maybe this is what we should do. Maybe I shouldn't do anything. But I don't know. Still, I'm, I'm actually exploring. That's, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, it's. I guess it's. It's more a comment uh, than a question. And and for many of uh, what I heard uh, so far, and definitely when there was this question of where we should look right now in Palestine. And, and I would still insist that refugee camps are a very interesting place, not only for Palestine, but for the rest of the world that they are writing books after books of the end of the nation state and, and how people can live in the nation state. And as if here, people cannot even imagine what does it mean to live without state, yet Palestinian refugees were living without state for 70 years. I mean, they are living also beyond uh, uh, notions of private and public. I mean, in refugee camps, people do not own their own houses, and they have no municipality to manage their place. Yet, on each pillar that they are building in the camp, it is completely negotiated with all neighbors. I mean, they create in refugee camps today in Palestine, after 70 years, there is, in terms of urban planning now I'm speaking, I mean, I'm, as an architect, I say there is a very interesting model of architecture that goes beyond private and public and that goes beyond state, which is for me, as an architect, is the most important and interesting example to study. So in that sense, I would follow you saying, let's look closely what happened and how people build and how they man managed by themselves, how they did not kill each, uh, each other. Because actually in, in a place like Fawar, for example, once happens that people kill each other because they built on the street and, and they were actually against each other. And, and you can imagine what will be happening while in Palestinian refugee camp, the level of violence is so low with people that are managing themselves. So I think that also Warsaw has a lot to learn from refugee camps, not only us Palestinians. So just to begin with by uh, answering you, but, but then I was a bit, um, not, I would not say disturbed, but uh, sort of alerted by the comment of the garbage. And I would like really to address this. And I understand fully it's something that I have been thinking about, I mean, as an architect, I worked all the time in the public space. And definitely, you know, you build public, you do a lot of workshops teaching kids to take care of plants and not to throw garbage, and you never succeed, right? And in that sense, I do not want to blame occupation, but I would like also to put your attention on, as architects, the first thing that we think is how you belong to the public. And if the public is your enemy, what happens? Right? I mean, we have been living under Israeli colonialism, and the street was for us the place where our kids were killed, is the place that is dangerous, is the place where we should not go in the night, and to add on top of this, we had the arrival of the Palestinian Authority and we never actually managed to process what is public for us. We never had a state. So if, I mean, in it, here it's easy to say public is state, is state managed and all is fine. While in a place like Palestine, it's not as straightforward. People hate public. I mean, they hate colonialism and therefore they hate public. They hate the neoliberal project that arises, and therefore they hate public. 
So in that sense, I'm not saying I'm not justifying, but I'm trying to sort of invite you to think what happens if you hate your public, right? What, what will be happening? And, and this, this would be the Palestinian dilemma. This is for me the Palestinian dilemma. This is where we all need, because we never had the sense of belonging to that, to what is in the street was where we were constantly threatened, right? I mean, and in that sense, I am inviting also all people to look at how we take care about our private and also all the plazas inside, inside the private. I mean, I have a father that he's, a, he's an engineer, electrical engineer, and he wakes up every morning at 5.30 to take care of his plants. And he is not willing to spend more than 10 days with me in Sweden because he is worried about his plants. So this is also Palestine, right? So in that sense, there is a lot of complexity on how we deal with public space and how, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really the most complex part of Palestine. And I think just to simplify it by a lot of garbage in the streets would not help at all. I mean, this is at least for me. I, I'm inviting you not to, you know, be, be judgmental without understanding the complexity of all what is happening in this place. I feel obliged <laughs> to say something. No, but um, the story of the rubbish is uh, exactly showing the complexity of the public and private, and that probably the link between all three of us here. Um, and uh, I fully understand that complexity. I mean, I fully, I probably don't fully understand, but I'm trying to fully understand that complexity. And I'm really not judgmental. This is why I, I was very happy finding Mohammed Badwan in, in his way out, because he's the light, really. But uh, uh, I remember in 2008, I was trying to make a public project in the refugee camp in Jenin. And to my amazement, there was not a public space in Jenin. I mean, I loved one building, which happened to be um, a building of former train station, because there used to be a train line during the Ottoman times that went through Jenin. And this was, to me, this was like opening the horizon. There was a train going through, through Palestine, you know, through the places I knew. So you could get on the train and travel. This was, you know, from the perspective of, a, of, a, of such an enclosure, of a, of a, of a kind of tight, closely tight, uh, a, a tightly closed tin, ready to explode, because that's how I felt myself. The imagination that the train would go through that through that landscape was an opening. So I was trying to kind of just put a sign on that building, it was a, an Ottoman a building from the Ottoman times, in a refugee camp train station. That was a whole project, and I kind of uh, we we were fantasizing with the theater that we would kind of buy uh, a, I don't know a carriage and uh, put it there, and um, I don't know bring the train line, you know, in a symbolic form, but. The fear of touching this building was so great, and the complexity of ownership of this building were completely paralyzing. So we couldn't do this project. But I, as an answer to what you said, we were, I was trying to find a way, and a, a, a piece of public of space in, in the refugee camp. It was extremely, extremely difficult. Of course, I understood it. I kind of pulled out, so it never happened. But. Um, I, uh, I kind of touched it from afar. No more questions. Maybe we can actually, we are out of time also, so we can uh, close it up, Ika. Maybe. Oh, no, 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 that's not the question. I thought I saw. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so